Father, uh, thank you. Thank you for the grace. Thank, thank you for loving us the way you do, Father. I pray, Lord, that you prepare our hearts even now, Lord. Uh, as we're praying, Father, we're asking you, Lord, to speak to us, to open up our hearts, to reveal yourself to us, Lord. Uh, draw us closer to you, Father. Remove those things in our lives that would uh, uh, cause us to stand at a distance, Lord, and just draw us in, Father. Just a, a big bear hug, Father. I Just uh, looking forward to that closeness uh, that we'll one day have with you, Father, and until then, Lord, just draw us closer. Father, we thank you for what you're about to do, Lord. We pray, Father, that you'd open up your word, that you would just anoint it, Father, and, and have it do its cleansing work in our lives, Father. And so we thank you, Father, for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week, we finished up the book of Philippians. Um, so tonight, we're going to jump into Ephesians, but we're going to pick it up in... I knew there was something wrong. Well, we're going to take a brief. Ah. <laughs> Do over, yes. What is this one? New. Nope. <laughs> I might, if I can't. I don't want to have to use my laptop. <laughs> Thanks, sweetheart. Always got to have a backup. What is the deal, though? Oop. Don't worry, I still have three minutes before eight. Uh. Nope. For some reason, I didn't make it to this one. I'm uh, going with the bigger one. Haven't done this one in a while. Earlier, I was looking at my uh, at my slide, and I was wondering how come when I switched over to the iPad, it didn't bring my little picture along to give me a clue that I was supposed to look at a slide. And I thought maybe it doesn't bring across PDFs, but now I understand what happened. So last week in the book of Philippians, uh, we finished up the letter uh, and we had gone over that it was a letter to the church in Philippi, uh, that he wanted to thank them for the gift of support that they had given to him. Uh, he wanted to also encourage them. Uh, but Paul wrote the letter while he was in Rome under house arrest and chained to a Roman guard while in custody, uh, Paul had used this time to invite to his home and people to his home and to share with them the gospel message, which was also being heard by the guards and the other people of Caesar's house at that time. In the end of the letter, we are told that there were a number of believers in Caesar's house and others that Paul was able to reach with the gospel message. And one of the things that had spoken to me in the book of Philippians was just the ability that Paul had to be content with wherever God had him, in jail, chained to a guard. And uh, I was sitting here tonight and worshiping, and my mind started jumping around. And uh, not to bad things, I just, you know, pray for this or that or, or thinking about that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, bring those thoughts into captivity. We don't have to let them run wild. And so uh, tonight I had written, you know, about the things that had spoken to me, but I didn't write that, you know, and it's like, I got to remember to keep those thoughts from running wild. I mean, if we let them run wild, they jump from one thing to the next and we find ourselves out there in left field, maybe turning away from the Lord, find ourselves in sin. So uh, yeah, a couple of things that spoke to me through the book of Philippians, one just being content and the other uh, bringing those thoughts captive. So um, I enjoyed the book, but Philippians was... Uh, 
was a good book. Paul had to be content. It was interesting to learn that this contentment that he had uh, wasn't something that came naturally to him, that he had to learn it. Uh, That is a whole lot easier to be discontent for us. We're just discontented people. You could say our default position is one of discontentment. So in order to get this kind of contentment that Paul had, we need to be trusting in Jesus to take care of us in every situation. Let him teach us how to be content. Because when we know that he is in control and we have peace with that, knowing he's going to take care of us, we can truly rest in him. We can be content. Tonight, we're going to be looking into the book of Ephesians, and uh, Paul is writing this letter also from a prison cell, waiting for a chance to present his defense before Nero, and I'm going to share just briefly how Paul ended up in prison. Uh, So if you remember, Paul was in Jerusalem, and if you give me just one second, I'm going to take this and make it readable. But anyways, Paul was in Jerusalem. Uh, He was... Uh, well, he was on his way to Jerusalem, and then when he got there, he was accused of uh, bringing Gentiles into the temple, if you remember. And a riot had started up, and they wanted to beat Paul to a pulp. And some of uh, the Roman troops heard the commotion, and they came and they grabbed Paul. Uh, I believe it said they had to carry him out of there because the people were so angry. And right before they got back to their base, Paul asks, he says, hey, can I speak to them uh, one more time? And They gave him permission to do that, even though they couldn't understand what he said. And he started to lay out his case for Jesus. But when he said the word Gentile, they tried to beat him to a pulp again. See, the story only gets worse for Paul. Eventually, he was sent out of Jerusalem for his protection to Caesarea. He was there for two years under a governor named Felix. But Felix was replaced by Festus. And wanting to please the Jews, Felix left Paul in prison for Festus to deal with. Well, Festus also was trying to please the Jews, and he wanted to take Paul back to Jerusalem to go over the charges again. But that was the last straw for Paul. He said, I've had enough. I'm going to appeal to Caesar. See, he was a a Roman citizen, and he had that ability to appeal to Caesar. And so Festus sent him to Caesar. And the whole journey just to get to Rome was one big ordeal. But Paul did make it to Rome, and now he waits his trial. And while waiting, he is ministering and writing letters. He's he's sharing the gospel message. This is one of the four prison letters that Paul wrote at this time. And Paul is writing to the churches in Ephesus. Now, I I do have a map I wanted to show you because I enjoy knowing where things are. And it gets better. I mean, after being to Jerusalem, you understand where things are. I sat on the Sea of Galilee. I put my toes in the water. You know, and so knowing where that is, well... This is Ephesus right here, and down in this area is Jerusalem. So there's Tarsus, where Paul, uh, Saul of Tarsus is from. And so he's made his way finally all the way over here. It's like a seaport town, and that is where he is at currently. And the reason that there is a group of believers here in Ephesus at this time is because of Paul. He had started this. See, at the end of his second missionary journey, Paul visited Ephesus just briefly, and he shared the gospel message. It doesn't seem like it was very long, but then he left those who were with him. Uh, he left and left those guys behind. He left Priscilla and Aquila and a couple of other people, and they stayed there. Well, later on, a man named Apollos came to Ephesus to share about God. And it says he was well-versed in the scriptures, and he taught the word accurately, but he only knew up to the baptism of John, which John came preaching, you know, saying that there's someone else that's coming that's greater than he is. He only knew up to that part. So Aquila and Priscilla told him about Jesus Christ, and it seems shortly after that he had a desire to go to move on to Achaia, which is just across the Aegean Sea. And I have another little map for you. And if you remember... We were talking about uh, Philippians is up in this area. I didn't realize I had cut off part of that in my map. But Philippians is up here. This is the area of Macedonia. Remember, he got a call to come over. And uh, so we have Philippians. We have Macedonia. We have Berea. And then we have Achaia down in here. And this is the area of Greece. Now, I saw some maps where it was further up and Greece is all over the place. But you see Ephesus right here. And you see a KI in this area over here. Well, Paulos, he jumps across the sea. I don't know if he island hopped or however he got across there. But he gets over to a KI. 
And it wasn't until Paul's third missionary journey that he spent some time, considerable time in Ephesus. He spent three years there. And we're told in Acts chapter 19, verse 8, it says, Paul went into the synagogue and he spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus both Jew and Greek. So it says everyone, which is amazing, had heard about Jesus Christ. It doesn't say everyone believed, but it says everyone heard. After three years, Paul left to Macedonia, which is just across the way, almost following uh, Apollos across. And then he, uh, he takes off from there. He wasn't there long. He's heading back to Jerusalem. And this is the time where Paul will be put in jail, where we mentioned uh, earlier, where he sits now writing these letters. Now, Paul knew all of this would happen because the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would be put in chains in Jerusalem, and he even told him that he would be uh, in Rome. Uh, you, he says, you witnessed of me in Jerusalem. Don't worry, you're also going to witness for me in Rome. So he knew what was up, uh, but the people had prophesied that this would happen to him also. He knows, and people are prophesying, and yet Paul trusted in the Lord and continued to go to Jerusalem. One more thing to mention before we get into chapter 1 of Ephesians. Uh, between the time Paul left Greece and arrived in Jerusalem, he made a brief stop just outside of Ephesus in Miletus and told them a couple of things that were going to happen to him. And this is kind of important for this letter. It says in Acts 20, 24, it says, But none of these things move me nor do I count my life dear to myself. He knows he's going to be put in chains. He knows that bad stuff awaits him. He says, but I don't count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. He says, this is the last time we're going to see each other. I'm going to Jerusalem right now, but yeah, this guy's prophesying about me, and I know this is going to happen, but this is the last time, guys. This is the last time you're going to see me. It's going to end in weeping and stuff, but he, this guy had spent three years with them, but he says to them, I'm not going to see you no more. Acts 20, 29 says, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now brethren, I commend you to God. I'm placing you in God's hands. I'm leaving you with him and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I think this backstory is important because you see the heart of Paul for these guys. You also see how he left the believers with tears and a heavy heart. So to get this letter from Paul would be a big deal. He said he's never going to see us again. We're never going to see him again. He had shared Christ. We're so thankful for this relationship we have. And now we're never going to see him again. But then all of a sudden a letter shows up. So Ephesians chapter 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, we know who wrote this letter because he identifies himself right off the bat. We do it in the end of a letter. He's doing it at the beginning. And if we were reading a scroll, we would have to unroll the whole thing just to find out who wrote the letter. So there's probably a reason why they put it in the very beginning. And even in Paul's greetings, we see him defending the call of God on his life. Now, an apostle is someone who is sent out under the authority and power of the one who sends him. And Paul declares that his apostleship, or the one who sent him, was Jesus Christ himself. Now, the early church had a list of what made up an apostle. That's it. You can find that in Acts chapter 1, verses 15 through 22. And you could argue that because of Acts 21 through 22, where Peter gets together with the other apostles and says, Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. 
Well, that leaves Paul out of the out of the running. See, Paul, according to those qualifications, is not an apostle. And you, if you were a false teacher, you could use this point and, as a way to discredit the ministry of Paul. So Paul starts right off pointing out that his apostleship doesn't come from Peter. It doesn't come from man, but it comes from Jesus Christ. An apostle is one who is sent, and he says, I was sent by Jesus Christ. It is like Paul is already addressing those false teachers who are trying to discredit the ministry right off the bat. And he says, to the saints. Now, here's the definition of a saint. Saints are people acknowledged as holy or virtuous and typically regarded as being in heaven after their death. Well, that's the definition I found online. And the way some people think when they hear the word saint. Well, you have to be dead, right? You would hear this definition more in a Catholic church than here. See, the word in Greek, which is how Paul would have said it, is hagios, probably pronounced differently, but uh, which means consecrated to God, holy or sacred. So he's writing to all who believe in Jesus Christ, and they're considered saints in the Bible. So writing to all the believers in Ephesus, every one of them. And he says in verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I was looking at this, and it's a typical greeting. Have you heard that it's a typical greeting of Paul's? I've heard that. Well, I thought, well, let's go see how typical this greeting is. So I printed up a slide for you. This is all the books that Paul had written. I got Ephesians, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Philemon, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and I think there's one more, but it didn't have grace and peace in the very beginning. All of them, almost exact. I've never seen them like that. I've never had anyone lay them out one after the other and look and see if they actually said the same thing. So it's typical. This is how Paul greets the churches, right? This is how he writes his letters. This is his, his greeting. Now, uh, the exception is First and Second Timothy and Titus. They're a little bit different. He adds mercy to them, but they're all the same. So uh, this is typical, but it always starts with grace. Grace is always first. And you think, well, if this is how Paul starts all of his letters, there must be some importance in this greeting that Paul would use it every time he writes a letter. Now, grace is the Greek word charis, and it means the merciful kindness and favor of God, which is not based on anything we have done. Now, this grace, it draws people to Christ. See, what the law could not do, grace is doing through Jesus Christ. We have done nothing to deserve this grace, this loving kindness of God's, and it is that love that God has for us that he would send his son so that whoever will believe in him can spend eternity with God. See, you have a a special place in his heart. You have been given the gift of salvation. This is the grace of God, and the grace is seen in Jesus Christ. Now, another way you can remember grace is by breaking the word apart. I don't know what you call it, where uh, you take grace and the G is God's and the R is riches at Christ's expense. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. I don't remember it that way, but uh, I remember that. And so every now and then uh, I'll remember grace and that's what it means, God's riches at Christ's expense. Personally, I always think of mercy when I think of grace and I think of playing the game of mercy. And uh, for me, mercy is not getting what you deserve, and grace is getting what you don't deserve based on who God is. That's how I remember it. The second thing we see in Paul's greeting is peace. And the word is arene in the Greek, and it means to join or to bind together that which has been separated, making them one again or back in sync or in harmony. So in this greeting, we have a simple statement that we have been given grace, and you can say based on that grace, we also have peace. See, the ultimate grace we have been given is in, is in God's own Son, Jesus Christ. And because of what he did for us, our relationship has been restored with the Lord, and we now have peace. If you remember, Peter was sent to a Gentile by the name of Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion. And when Peter finally arrived at his home, the message Peter gave to this man and all those with him was about the peace we have in Jesus Christ. It says in Acts 10, 
verse 34, it says, Then Peter opened his mouth, and he said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. He goes on later and he says in verse 43, To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Not much more to the message that Peter gave, but as he says this, the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius and all his household and they all become saved. And Peter's like, I didn't do anything. I don't know what happened. You're a witness, you know, because he had some Jewish people with him. When we go back, you vouch for me. I didn't do nothing. And so this is Peter and telling them about the peace we have in Jesus Christ and that we can all have this through his name, through his son, the remission of sins. See, there is forgiveness. Our sins are done away with through Jesus Christ and we can have a peace. Now, I was studying and I read a quote from Charles Spurgeon who said, A genuine Christian dreads sin. He cannot say, It's only a little sin, for he knows that a little sin is like a small dose of very potent poison. It is sufficient to destroy our peace and comfort. Sin injures your faith, destroys your enjoyment, withers up your peace, weakens you in prayer, and hurts your witness to others. The Christian's heart, he says, is like Noah's dove. It flies over the wide waste and cannot rest the sole of its foot until it comes back to Christ. He is the true Noah who puts out his hand and takes in the weary, fluttering dove and gives it rest. There is no peace the whole world over but with Jesus Christ. I like that little saying. We can have peace in Jesus Christ. Paul goes on to say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So he's saying, praise God for his blessings on us. He has blessed you with every spiritual blessing there is in the heavenly realm. And that sounds great, but what is it? Do I need blessings in the heavenly realm? And why didn't he say he has blessed us with those blessings here today? Where I'm at right now, I need blessings here. I don't need blessings in the heavenly realm. The problem is that we think for us that the heavenly realm begins when we die and go to heaven. But would you consider it a blessing to have your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Well, where's that book at? If you believe in Jesus, then it's there. It's in the heavenly realm. Jesus said he's going to prepare a place for you. And where is he preparing this place at? In the heavenly places. Okay, I get it. What other blessings do I have? Do I already have these in the heaven? See, you are blessed to understand the gospel. You have your sins forgiven. You have been adopted and made sons and daughters. God is growing you, drawing you closer to himself. You are able to store treasures in heaven. You have also been sealed with the Holy Spirit. I'm sure there are other things that you could add to this list, but we have been blessed. And if the only blessing we ever received was faith in Jesus Christ, that would be enough. We would be blessed more than we deserve. But God gives us so much more. And he blesses us here as well. It is wonderful to think about how blessed we are. And after the book of Philippians, we should be thinking on things like that, on whatever is true, whatever is noble. And these blessings come from God and are given to us through his Son. He goes on in verse 4 and says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You know, this book, this letter to the Ephesians, it tells us a lot about what God has blessed us with. If you look at this chapter, there are a lot of things he's given us. You could put your name to all of these. He's blessed you with blessings in the heavenly realm. It says that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we could be holy, blameless. We've been chosen. This was God's plan all along. He didn't come up with the law and then decide, well, that's not going to work. Let's try something different. This way of salvation through Jesus Christ has always been the plan. He chose us, but not everyone chooses him. 
And it is hard to think that God was thinking about you and I before man or the earth ever existed. I was thinking about this today and thinking, you know, God's talking to Jesus and he's saying right here in this empty space, one of these days, Bill is going to be standing right there sharing my word with the people. And Jesus is standing there and he's saying, it's going to be on a Thursday night. I know there's nothing there, but I'm going to make a place called earth for him. And he will believe in you, my son that you died for him. Wait, 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 I'm going to die? You know, uh, what's going to happen? You know, it, it was just a crazy thought, and you can continue to think about it, but it was just me trying to think about what a conversation about me would have looked like before the foundation of the earth ever, ever existed, before I was ever born. But he says he's chosen me. He's chosen you. He has a plan for you for this day and age that he's working on. Um, we would be holy and without blame before him is his desire. But none of us on our own are holy and without blame. But we are no longer doing it on our own. See, we now live for Christ. And Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, he's given us a new nature in him so we can now live holy and without blame before him in love. He's living his life through us. All those sins, all those faults he wants to take away. He says in verse five, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. Now, this word adoption is a great word, and it speaks of being placed in a position of a son or daughter who now possesses the same rights as the parent's natural children. It means to formally and legally declare that someone who is not your own child from now on is to be treated and cared for as your own, because they legally are, including complete rights of inheritance. I think we all have some idea of how this works. You are legally adopted. You are their child. You have this new family. Your old family's done. You don't belong to them no more. And as I was looking into the, this aspect of being adopted, uh, it also talks about having a new father. See, we don't keep our old fathers. You know, I could be adopted, but I still have... The, the guy who was responsible for my birth, right? No, it's done away with in this aspect of being adopted. You don't have another father. You have a new father, this father who is going to take care of you. Um, he is in charge of raising you, caring for you, providing for you in every aspect, like a master and a slave, but so much more intimate. And Jesus was talking to the Jews when he said in John chapter 8, verse 44, you are of your father, the devil, and to the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. See, we are all born with a sin nature, and you could say, without Jesus Christ, we too are following after our father, the devil. Now, as God's children, though, we are no longer under the authority of our old father. We are under God's authority. We have a new father. We're not even connected any longer. We don't belong here. And we are accepted in the beloved. God has placed us in his beloved. And we know that this beloved is Jesus Christ because God spoke of him himself. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, right? It's kind of his nickname for him. But God told us, uh, well, Romans chapter 8, look at that one, verse 14. It says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. We've been adopted. We have a new father. We are part of the family. And the word adopted doesn't even apply anymore. We are sons and daughters. We're no longer adopted. That, that term is gone. We belong. We are his own. There is nothing he can do to get rid of us. We are his children. 
He goes on in verse 7 and says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence. Now, this redemption carries the idea of a ransom. Redemption is the process of buying back, ransoming, recovering something by paying a price. Deliverance from enslavement of sin and release to a new freedom in Jesus Christ. See, if someone you loved was held against their will, what would you pay to get them back? Redemption requires a payment for something that at one point in time was yours. And in this case, you are paying to free someone from the bondage they are in. It's the act or the process of freeing you. See, in Jesus Christ, we have been freed, and the price that was paid is his life. Jesus gave his life, and through his blood, we have forgiveness of sins, it says. Our debt is wiped away. See, sin is what held us captive, and it demanded a payment. And the only payment sin demanded was death. And if we die in our sins, not accepting Jesus, then we will suffer for all eternity. But the good news is that the payment has already been made. The Philippian jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? And that is one of the greatest questions you can ask. What must I do to be saved? And the Bible has a lot to say about it. Paul's reply to the jailer is the same for you and me. He said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You're going to be saved. You're going to have everlasting life. It is so simple to have salvation. It's on the tip of your tongue, it says. You can be saved. But the cost of that salvation costs more than anyone could pay. So God sent his son who became flesh and blood and died for us so we could have this salvation. One of the things I need, think we need to point out is that there is only one payment available to redeem you and I. There is no other way to be redeemed. We are also told in these verses that he gives us according to the riches of his grace. Now we know grace is God's unprovoked, undeserved favor, but how much will he give us of this grace? Is there a limit? Well, how rich is God? Well, if you think in terms of money, just a chunk of the street in heaven would pay for quite a lot. But when it comes to grace, is there a limit? I don't believe there is. See, the blood of Jesus can take away the sins of the world. It talks about in John 1, 29, but God loves you so much and nothing will change that. And the grace we have received is not based on us at all, but based on him. So we didn't earn it, and we can never exhaust the grace of God in our life. I was reading another verse before I got here, and it was talking about how God's going to dote, how he's going to show off his grace later on to us sinners, to the people that were saved. He's going to use us as an example of just how deep and how vast his grace is. In verse 8, he makes it abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence. See, God doesn't just give to us this grace in tiny little doses. To abound means to have an abundance of. He lavishes his grace on us out of his riches, it says. So we cannot exhaust this grace. God loves us so much. He's planned for us before the beginning of time for us to be right here, right now. He has a plan for each one of our lives. And he is pouring on the grace. And later on, he's going to be bragging on us. You know, it's been another week. Maybe you've had a great week compared to the one before. But maybe you didn't. Perhaps this has been one of the worst weeks you've had in a long time. See, you have done things you wish you could take back. But it's not too late. He is a wonderful, amazing father who loves you. And we're told to ask him for forgiveness. Let him know you're sorry, and he will forgive you. That is a promise. I guarantee you have not found the end of his riches. He wants to bless you. You are his kids. You are grafted into the family. You have an inheritance. All of these blessings he's promised to you. 
He has a plan for your life. And he's doing a work. And Paul's just laying out all the things that God has given us. It's a great letter. I'd encourage you to go and read it for yourself. And look at the things he's promised to each one of us. Look at the things he's promised to you personally. Take a good look at it. Read it before we get together next time. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the love you've poured out on us, Lord. Uh, for the grace that you continue to lavish on us, Father. We thank you for uh, just your word today, Lord. Uh, Father, I thank you, Lord, that we can call you our Father. That you've done all this work. You've made it so simple through your Son, You've given us blessing upon blessing. And Lord, I know it cost you so dearly, Lord. I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for my part in that, Father. But I thank you for loving me like you do, Lord. I pray, Father, for all of us here tonight, Lord, that you'd help us to see who we are in you, how much you love us and care for us, Lord, how much you've forgiven us, Lord. And help us, Father, just to come to you afresh again, Lord. Forgive us for those areas where we've gone astray, Lord. Protect us this next week, Father, and help us to live it for you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.